And Sharma, thank you so much for joining The Daily Oz. Thank you for having me, Billy. It's so exciting to be here. So you have worked with independent Senator David Pocock on something called the Duty of Care Bill, which is currently being considered by the Senate. Can you start by just explaining what exactly is that? Yeah, so the duty of care bill would be an amendment to the already existing Climate Change Act. And basically within that act, it would insert a duty um, where governments, when they're considering decisions to approve fossil fuel projects, have to consider the impact of making these decisions on the health and well-being of young people. So basically, if they are asked to make one of these decisions, they are then required to take into account all available evidence to determine whether the approval of such a project will pose a tangible risk to the health and well-being of young people and if it will then they will not be allowed to let that fossil fuel project go ahead. So it basically means that any decision made in the context of climate change has to be weighed up against the needs and interests of young people. So to give it a real life example if the government was considering whether or not to approve a coal mine you want it to be a legal obligation that they have to consider the effects that this coal mine will have on future generations. Yeah, absolutely. And with that would come um, the need to consider the size of the project, the length and duration of the project, whereabouts it would be built um, and all factors like that. But it would essentially formalise in legislation uh, the acknowledgement that it is young people who will be very intrinsically impacted by climate change and that all decisions like that coal mine um, have to be weighed up against our rights, our needs and our interests. And at the time that we are recording this, you have literally just heard of a new update on the status of this bill. What was that? Yeah, so the Senate committee who has been inquiring into this bill was about to hand down their report on Wednesday the 27th of March. So essentially we've been going through a public submissions process uh, where everybody's been able to make submissions to the government about this bill, which was then followed up by um, hearings where experts were called to give evidence to the Senate. The Senate, after all that evidence has been given, was about to write a report with their recommendations of this bill, and that was meant to be handed down on Wednesday the 27th of March. We've literally just received word that that will now be pushed out until the 2nd of June. Um, That's quite a substantial pushback, but we hope that it indicates that the government is actually considering some of the key issues and sticking points within the bill, and really considering how they can implement this legislation in a way that's mutually agreeable between us, Senator Pocock, as well as them. Um, So a way that really benefits all parties. Is there any precedent for this kind of thing around the world? Yeah, absolutely. So what we're asking the government to do is not an international anomaly in any sense of the manner. Um, There are countries, 161 in fact, that have recognised that young people have the right to a healthy environment. There are countries that have gone much further than that. There's um, Wales, which has both a Future Generations Act and a Future Generations Commissioner. So the purpose of the Commissioner is to scrutinise all legislation that is drafted and passed in Wales against the needs and interests of Wales as young people. So the Commissioner looks at how any legislation that is proposed could affect young people and is empowered to disallow any legislation that isn't compatible with our needs. Now, to get this through, you would need the support of the government. And a few weeks ago, I actually interviewed the Climate Change Minister, Chris Bowen, and I asked him about this bill. And he basically said that he's just focused on getting on with the job um, in terms of planning for the transition to renewables. And he said that he, he doesn't believe that we need this enshrined in legislation. What's your response to that? Look, if he's considering getting on with the job, then this duty of care bill absolutely falls into the roadmap of doing that. What we're offering to the government is a good faith proposal for them to put into place their legislation better, for them to reach the targets that they have set for themselves that they might not completely be on track to reach. Up till now, they don't have a single piece of legislation that speaks to the needs of young people. And we hope that this bill would be a way for the government to acknowledge that young people do stand to be dis- proportionally affected by climate change, but also a tool in the government's belt for them to reach those targets faster. We don't see why this wouldn't fit into the roadmap of getting on with the job, as the minister put it. The government has said that they won't support it, basically. The opposition has also said that they won't support it. So just if this doesn't get through, what's next? It's not a my way or the highway situation at all. It 
comes this legislation has come from the belief that young people should be acknowledged um, in policy in the fact that we will be most affected by climate change and if that needs to be done in a different manner later on down the line then we're absolutely willing to work with the government on that um, as long as our end goal is to achieve legislation along this line. Now this is not the first time that you have actually tried to fight the government on climate change so at the moment you're trying to do it by passing legislation but you've previously done it by actually suing the government. For those who don't know, can you just tell us what happened last time? Um, It started in 2020 and myself and seven school-age students took the former federal environment minister, Susan Lee, to court. And we argued that she owed and was breaching a duty of care to young people to protect us from the impacts of climate change. Now, initially on that, argument, we were successful and the federal court ruled in our favour. They found that the government did have a duty of care to young people. Unfortunately, the government then took us back to court and um, appealed this decision. The federal court on that instance found in favour of the government, but when they did so, it was a really, really interesting decision in that they didn't necessarily say that the duty of care doesn't exist. They said that if it does exist, it should be legislated by parliament and not imposed on them by the courts. So that's essentially led us to where we are now, because we interpreted that pretty much as a mandate to demand that Sure, if the federal court has washed their hands of this responsibility and kind of handballed it over to Parliament, then it's on Parliament to pick it up from here and, you know, run with it. I mean, it's crazy just taking a moment to think that you literally sued the government when you were in high school and now you're in uni and you're trying to pass legislation. You've done so much. Like we said, you're 19, you're still at uni. What has it been like lobbying the government when you're so young? Where competing against people who have much greater and deeper knowledge of legislation and parliamentary processes than we do. So it's it's quite scary sometimes. It's quite inaccessible. It really, really, really is an uphill battle. Um, but we have the support of so, so many people. We have the support of, of NGOs, of so much of the health sector, of businesses, of the 400 people who made submissions to the duty of care um, Senate inquiry. And so the one thing we never feel um, is alone because we know that this bill is supported by so, so much of wider society. You spend so much time thinking about climate change and trying to get the government to do more. What would you say to anyone listening who suffers from climate anxiety? The biggest antidote to climate anxiety is action and to feel like you yourself are making a difference um, in the world. But to do that, you don't have to have like any specific skills. Um, You just have to be passionate about something because I always tell everyone to find their niche. If you're passionate about art or music or sport, then I promise you that there are organisations in that sector that are using their passion and what they do um, as a way to bring awareness to the climate crisis. So if you find your niche, if you find your passion, then you already have a gateway into the world of climate action and that's the best way to deal with climate anxiety. There might be some people wondering, how did you get into this? So I've kind of always been around the impacts of climate change. I have seen climate change hit my home country and my family of India quite severely, especially in recent years where there have been horrific heat waves and floods. But living on the other side of the world, I haven't really had to go through that to the same extent. And that's concocted in me a weird mix of anger and injustice that kind of first led me to join School Strike for Climate. And I organised those massive strikes back in 2019 that saw hundreds and thousands of people take to the streets around Australia. Through that, I met people who would go on to become part of the legal team that would work with us to take the former federal environment minister to court. Since then, I guess every opportunity has kind of come as a flow and effect to that. But it all started with the 15-year-old girl who kind of had that sense of climate anxiety and anger and injustice and didn't know what to do, so went along to an organising meeting for School Strike for Climate and is now here at the end of a very long five-year road um, lobbying in Parliament. Well, we will continue to follow this story. And thank you so much for joining The Daily Oz. Thanks for having me, Billy. Billy.